Sam Harris is openly reviled by many. His contempt for Donald Trump is well known. And because of that, he's attracted an enormous amount of criticism. Some of it, in my opinion, justified. But this is not new for Sam Harris. This is a guy who's not afraid to wade into controversial territory, even when it's not in his best interest to do so. Think of the amount of regressive scorn he's garnered around his stance on Islam, or profiling, for example. Agree with him or not, this is a guy that thinks deeply about what he says. Well, maybe not always, but he's only human. But when he does think deeply, which is most of the time, that doesn't mean he's right. But you can bet he's thought through his position before taking one. And so while a lot of the liberal media and intelligentsia are still shell-shocked, sitting around, scratching their heads, looking for explanations without a shred of self-awareness that they might be to blame for the rise of Donald Trump? Sam Harris isn't. He actually gets it. What you're about to hear is excerpted from his latest podcast. I suggest you go listen to the full 30 minutes. But this is the salient part for me. This is not offered as a defense of Sam Harris. But even if you're an ardent Trump supporter, I think you'll agree with at least 90% of what Sam Harris says here. I share the view that the election was generally a repudiation of the left and of political correctness in particular, as much as it was just a vote for change. It was a repudiation of black and brown identity politics by white identity politics. And it's important to point out that this isn't the same as racism. Okay, I don't believe that a majority of the people who voted for Trump were motivated by racism. There are people who voted for Obama twice who voted for Trump. Racism cannot be the best way to explain that. And this is where the prevailing analysis on the left is wrong, of the sort that I just read from David Remnick in The New Yorker. But yes, we have just elected a man who was officially endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan. So you can be sure that every white racist in the country voted for Trump. But there are millions of other decent people who have reasonable concerns about a movement like Black Lives Matter. And most of these people probably voted for Trump, too. These people are not racists. They were simply recoiling from charges of racism and from a toxic brand of identity politics. Much of what has been coming out of the left, not everything, but much of it, particularly about race and about law and order and about Islamophobia and terrorism, about issues that are fundamental to the security of our society, has had all the moral clarity and intellectual honesty of the OJ verdict, which is to say none at all. And I'm confident that many people who don't perceive Trump to be a dangerous con man in the way that I do probably voted for him out of sheer exasperation. They were sick of being called racist for not worrying about Halloween costumes on our Ivy League campuses. So millions of these people along with real racists, told all you whinging social justice warriors at Yale and Brown to go fuck yourselves. And can you really blame them? I mean, safe spaces, trigger warnings, new gender pronouns, getting Muslim student groups to deplatform speakers like Ayan Hirsi Ali and Bill Maher. Was that the cause of your generation? That's the trench you are willing to die in? So the question is, would a democratic campaign that leaned even further to the left have prevailed in this situation? I doubt it. And did Sanders have anything sensible to say about foreign policy? Would he have been able to address fears about terrorism? It certainly didn't seem that way at the time. And I suspect that this really is the crux of the issue. At least it's the main reason why even those who saw Trump's flaws didn't care about them. Okay, the problem that worried me the whole time is the left's total failure 
to speak honestly about Islam and terrorism and the refugee crisis in Europe. And this, I think, was decisive. Certainly was one of the things that, had it gone the other way, would have given us a different result. Admittedly, it seems strange to cite polls at this point, but what else can I do? The exit polls show that the people who said their primary concerns were terrorism and immigration voted overwhelmingly for Trump, whereas those who were concerned about the economy or foreign policy voted for Clinton. So it wasn't the economy stupid this time around, though economic fears certainly played a role. And it wasn't just poor whites who supported Trump. The median income of Trump voters was $72,000. And I think that in this election, concerns about terrorism and immigration largely boil down to a concern about Islamism and to the fear and distrust provoked by liberal lies about it. Immigration means other things, of course, but I don't think it's mainly that there were a lot of white people whose median income is $72,000 who want to pick strawberries for a living. If my collisions on social media told me anything over the last year, it's that many people were nearly single-issue voters when it came to Islam. I would bet that this accounts for many more people than voted for a third-party candidate, which was also probably decisive. The fact that we have a president who wouldn't even use the phrase Islamic extremism, who could even say things like terrorism has less to do with Islam than any other religion, right? And the fact that Clinton seemed to embrace this delusion, even though she did on occasion use the phrase radical jihadism, as though that made any sense, that was a terrible problem. And of course, the fact that she and her husband had taken tens of millions of dollars from the Saudis and other Islamist regimes didn't help. We couple that with this unexplained desire to increase the number of Syrian refugees by 550% without ever acknowledging what is going wrong in Europe. This was a deal breaker for many people. And I heard from these people endlessly over the last year. And the problem, of course, is that people are right to be worried about Islamism and jihadism. And all the left has offered on this point are lies and sanctimony and charges of racism and bigotry. Worrying about Islam more than any other religion at this moment is not a sign of racism or bigotry. Muslims themselves should be worried more about Islam at this moment than about Mormonism, or Anglicanism, or Judaism. This is basic human sanity. And most people know it. But Clinton was the sort of politician who, in the immediate aftermath of the Orlando massacre, spoke only about gun control and then issued grave warnings about a rise in Islamophobia. When we had just suffered yet another jihadist atrocity on American soil. This was unforgivably stupid. And I knew it at the time, that this was the sort of stupidity that could pave the way for Trump. I even wrote a section of a speech I thought Clinton should give about Islamism and jihadism and put it on my blog. It would have been so easy for her to have made sense on this issue and to have differentiated a sane understanding of jihadism from bigotry against Muslims in general. But she couldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. 